Good morning, Miss Anita, Sister Anita, and Brother Sam. Good to see you. Good morning, Sister Harvey. Sister Florette, good morning. All right, we'll wait one more minute and then we will move forward from there. Good morning, uh, Brother Foster, Foster family. Good to see you. Good morning, Sister Carr. Good to see you this morning. All right, it is 11.01 and we will go ahead and get started for this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Our call to worship this morning on this Pentecost Sunday is the day of Pentecost is here. The day when the flames of faith dance in our hearts. The day of Pentecost is here. The day when our babbling speech becomes the good news for the Lord. The day of Pentecost is here. The day when compassion is seared into our souls, the day of Pentecost is here. And let the people rejoice and say hallelujah. The day of Pentecost is here. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Come like a whirlwind of wonder and sing to the groanings and the cries and the complaints and the hurts of our people. Come, God, in a still and small voice of hope and inflame us with your passion for justice, for love. Come, God, as a liberator of the least and purify us of our grasping greediness. Come, God, as an advocate for our selfless living and silence our gossip and turn it and to a servant's heart. God, come as harmony of God of your heart. Let your wind, let the wind of God blow through us. Let the fire of God burn within us. Let the tongue of God speak to us on this day of renewal and birth. Even as we pray, God, teach us to pray in harmony, in spirit, in truth, in love, seeking to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Acts 4, verses 31 through 33. Acts 4, verses 31 through 33. And the word of the Lord reads, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and grace was upon them all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
I'd like to bring to your attention this morning um, the subject from these verses that I just read, Acts 4, 31 through 33, the subject, plugging into his power. Plugging into his power. Pentecost means 50th. And it refers to the Jewish feast held 50 days after the second day of the Passover. But when we look at the day of Pentecost as referred to in Acts 1, Jesus was with them for 40 days and then ascended back to heaven. 10 days after ascension and 50 days after resurrection. The Holy Spirit descends upon the, her, the early followers of Jesus like a fire. And, Acts 2, and in Acts 2, they have been given the mission of preaching the good news. On this day, set aside, to, set aside to praise the Lord for giving his people a great harvest. And the Lord began to harvest the lost souls of the world through his church. We saw that amazing things happened. Amazing things took place specifically on Pentecost Day. As, as, as when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, they began speaking in tongues and many, many miracles happened during the events following, during the events of Pentecost. And I don't know about you, but I marvel at the power of the early church. From the days, from the events of Pentecost on into the days of the early church, it amazes me to look at the ways in which God used believers for his glory. If we look in the book of Acts from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 2 to chapter 4, the church was marked by powerful miracles and, and larger-than-life personalities, and they experienced amazing growth and, and that, 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 that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And it lets us know that there was something different about the early church that we don't tap into, that, that we don't see, that, that, that we may not understand, that we don't plug into today in the contemporary church. Most believers long for that same kind of power today. We know that we don't have we don't know that we don't have what they have had, but that we want it. Let me say that again because I bumbled over it. We know that we don't have what the early church had, but we want it so bad. We know that we must have the same kind of power if we're going to be effective in our walk with God. Of course, in some ways, we possess far more than they did because we have nice buildings, we have enough money to do some of the things we want, many of the things we need, we have amazing technology, and we have the freedom to worship God as we please. But while we have much more in our favor, we lack the one thing that made the early church a mighty weapon in the hand of God. Many times, we lack the power of God. We lack the power of God. What was the source of their power? On the day of Pentecost and, and many days after, what, what was the source that the early church plugged into, uh, uh, that tremendous power source that we need today? What we find in these verses and what we find in this text in Acts 4, 31 through 33, is that the early church was plugged into three specific sources of power that enabled them to turn the world upside down for the glory of God. And the power that rested on the early church was available to the contemporary church. We just have to plug into the same sources of power that they used in that day. And so to fight the deadly virus called COVID-19 that threatens our bodies 
and to fight the deadly, uh, the deadly virus of racism that constantly threatens our humanity, I want to show you from these verses the sources that empowered the early church. If we want to reach our world for Jesus, if we want to be all that the Lord wants us to be, if we are going to plug into the same power that turned the world and the church back then upside down, we have to take a few moments today and look and really focus on plugging into his power. If we want to really change our families, if we really want to shake things up, if we really want to change our communities and our neighborhoods and change minds and perspectives and behaviors, we have to plug into his power. And so the first thing that we need to plug into is the power of prayer. If you look at the text, the context of these verses, when the disciples came back from their meeting from Sanhedrin, the whole assembly came together in prayer. And as they prayed together in one mind, the spirit of God moved upon them and filled them with his presence and his power. That means that God honored the prayers of his people when they came together as one, praying for the common good. Probably nothing that we do in our Christian walk is, is, is as important as prayer. Yeah, I know it sounds simple. Yeah, I know it's something that seems very medi mediocre and very small, but nothing that we do is more powerful than prayer. Prayer is the secret power to the power of God. Why? because we have been given great promises in prayer. We have been given clear instructions in prayer. We have been commanded to pray. And yes, we do pray. But many times we do not often pray like the early church prayed. We usually resort to prayer when we are shaken. But the early church prayed to be shaken. We pray, but we don't pray fervently. We pray, but we don't pray specifically. We pray, but we don't pray on one accord. We pray, but we don't pray as a group. We have to learn to pray together and pray to be shaken, not just pray when we need something, pray when we want something, pray when things are shaken shaking us up and, 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 and powers are shaking us up, but we have to pray for the power to, for God to shake us up in our altar calls, in our prayer meetings, and in other times, we have to learn to pray as a group and make our petition unto God. We need our faces on, on our church and our faces and bow as our bodies and wage war together in prayer. Of course, we learn to pray by praying. We learn to pray by asking God for impossible things and believing that God will give us what others deemed impossible. We learn to pray by reading the word of God and praying it back to him in faith. The early church had the power of God on them because they prayed together and they prayed for God to shake some things up in their lives. And whatever God chose to do, we would trust them anyhow. Many times we don't pray to God for God to have his way. We pray for God for God to do it our way. But at some point and sometime, we have to learn to trust God fully and in trusting God, know and trust that if we believe on him and if we have faith in his will and his way, then God will and God God will and God will make things happen in our lives that we never deem possible, but we got to trust him. We have to join as a group in prayer and we have to know that prayer is one of the keys to our power. Not only is prayer part of our power source, but we also have to plug into the power of passion. 
If we look at the text, we are told that this congregation was of one heart and of one soul. That is that they, they did not live for themselves, but they lived for those around them. These people were lost in the needs of other believers and they were consumed by the needs of the lost around them. The early church possessed a servant's heart that was just like the Lord Jesus Christ. These people lived out of the will of the Savior. And while Jesus was there, he said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have loved one to another, then you have also loved me. Jesus said that, that his people would be known for the love that they possess for the other believers around them. He went on to tell us that he, uh, that the, and, and went on to tell us to the church that they all may be one as thy father art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so when we love one another as we should, when we, when we walk in unity as we should, it lets the world around us know that our profession of faith is real and that we truly belong to Christ. Many of us ask the question, why are people coming to church? Why did people, why did people stop coming to church? Why are our young people and our young adults not coming to church? Because we don't present ourselves as one body in love one to another. People see it. People believe how you act and how you behave and how you disconnect instead of connect as a body and as a church. People see it and they don't want to be a part of it. If we are going to lift Jesus up in our worship and lift Jesus up in our praise and lift people, Jesus up in our programs, we also have to lift people up in our love. And so when we love one another, when we learn to love people that hate us and despitefully use us, when we learn to pray for each other, when we learn to forgive people for the times that they hurt us, when we love as we should. And I begin to seek your best interest instead of my own best interest. When I love like I should and treat others like they should be treated, even when I don't like their ways, when I love people as I should and be considerate as uh, for others and, 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 and allow other people to be who they are and accept them who they are. When I love as I should, that is when the love of Christ permeates into the hearts of those who are lost. And that is when our churches and our own hearts will be filled. Love gives us power. And without love, we lack the power of God we need to be effective in this age. We have to plug into the power of a genuine, all-consuming passion for others. Lastly, we need to plug into the power of proclamation. While the early church was marked by prayer and love, they were also marked by the proclamation of the gospel. They were a preaching people. They carried the message of the gospel to a world that desperately needed that message. Many times we don't take on the power of proclamation because we feel like the power of proclamation is only given to the preacher. But you have also been called to preach a message that nobody else can preach because it is the power and proclamation of what God has done in your life. What, has, what God has done for you, what, how God has changed your world and changed your mind and changed your perspective and reset you and gave you a better day. That is the power of proclamation. Verse 33 tells us that that great power rested on the apostles, that their preaching and their witness as effect was as effective because God empowered their preaching and he blessed the proclamation of the gospel. I wonder what would happen if you stopped being ashamed and embarrassed of your story and truly proclaimed what God has done for you in your life. 
I wonder what power you may not may be holding back on from God that God is trying to give you right now because you're trying to keep your moments a secret when God told you to proclaim it and tell it because it tells of the transformational power that I gave you. Quit hiding and be who I called you to be. I called you to tell your story. I called you to tell the personal parable that is in your life and is in your heart that I gave you to save another lost person. I called you to proclaim. We have power in the proclamation. And yes, the modern church was marked by prayer and by love. And yes, the modern church was 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 proclaimed by unity. But the modern, but the early church, what we don't have that the early church had was that they were not ashamed to tell the story. They were not ashamed to tell the story of how God moved them. They were not ashamed of how to how the how the, the, to, to tell the story of how they doubted God, but God saw them through anyway. They were not ashamed to tell the story about how God made ways out of no ways and impossible things into possibilities. They were not ashamed to proclaim. We will have to keep in mind as a body in Christ that there's a whole world around us that needs to hear about Jesus. And it is not us hitting them upside the head with scripture. It is not us using the Bible against them to condemn them. It is the power to proclaim who God is to us. That is when God gets into gets into the save. That is when we get into the saving of souls, and God is able to be about God's business when we empower each other with our own selves. And so, the power of prayer, the power of love, and the power of proclamation is paramount to the power to shake things up in our churches, in our families, in our communities, in, our, in, in all of the things that are happening right now. It is the power that we must plug into as people of God. It is the passion for others. It is the prayers of the righteous. It is the proclamation and being empowered by the proclamation of our stories that allows the salvation of our souls that allows the peace of our communities and the peace in our own hearts. In such a time as this, where our world is in unrest, we have to stick to the basics. And the basics are to pray, to have passion for others, and to proclaim when we plug into this power, there is nothing we cannot do. When we plug into this power, there is no weapon that it can come against us. When we plug into this power, we are able to shake up the powers and the principalities that come into our families, that plagues our communities, that, that, that messes up our world. When we plug into these basic elements of power. That is when, and that is only when, God can do great things. Amen, amen, and amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, gracious God, God of grace and glory, you have already given us the, the strategies and the weapons that we need to fight a war that cannot be fought and won by man's hands. It cannot be fought, fought by words. It cannot be fought by anything that we do, but it can only be fought by the fire inside of us, the fire of the Holy Spirit that you gave us on Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost. Now, God, bless us and remind us to know that we have power in our prayers that we have power in our passion, that we have power in our proclamation. And it is the same power 
that the early church used way back centuries ago to change things in our lives. And so, God, we pray for, the, for, for you to give the light to all nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to set the prisoner free. Help us to answer your call that these things may come to pass, God. God of grace and glory, we pray for those who suffer from pain and sorrow. We pray for those whose hearts are break, broken. We pray for those whose families are fractured. We pray for those whose lives are ravaged by war. We pray for those who struggle with poverty and starvation. We pray for our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for pouring out your spirit on your son and pouring your spirit out on us. May we too hear you to say this day that my son, my daughter, the beloved with whom I am well pleased, for you are God and God alone. And you have given us grace, you have given us mercy, you have given us love, and you have given us power. And we thank you on this day. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and thank you and give you glory and say amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I hope that you have been blessed by this message and our, our worship service this morning. Please know that if you are in need of prayer, know that there is power in prayer. And if you need a prayer partner, then we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and I will pray with you. All you got to do is inbox me, and we will pray together. Please know that if you, and if, if, if you need a relationship with God or you feel like you have lost God during this time, please, please, please know that I am here for you. All you got to do is inbox me right now and we will pray and we will come together in the name of Jesus as one. When two or three are gathered, then God is indeed in the midst. And so inbox me and call me if this message has, has, has touched your heart. And we will do what we need to do so that you can grow and be who you need to be in God. I have a couple of announcements for you. Please take note that the soup kitchen will be giving out care packages on Saturday, June the 6th from 11 p.m. until 1 p.m. You all have been so generous in your giving to the soup kitchen to provide for, for families during COVID-19 that we don't even need donations this time because we have so much to give. And so thank you for your kind and generous heart. And please know that we will be giving out those care packages on June the 6th, this coming Saturday from 11 until 1 p.m. Also know that we will be having our virtual Vacation Bible School. I'm very excited about that from June 8th until the 12th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And so you will be hearing from Ms. B and Sister Florette concerning Vacation Bible School. Get excited because I'm excited about our first virtual Vacation Bible School. We are also celebrating our youth graduates in our 2020 virtual graduation celebration service. So I don't care if your baby graduated from pre-K, graduated from uh, kindergarten, graduated from high school, wherever they graduated from, if they went on to the next grade, we're going to celebrate them. And so make sure to give those names to Miss B or Sister Florette inbox us here on the um, on the Facebook page so that we can acknowledge and recognize how proud we are of our youth. We are still working on our Sunday service via Zoom. It is coming up on the first Sunday. Look out for it because it's going to be good. And make sure to, to get whatever you need to celebrate communion, grape juice and a saltine cracker, whatever you have at home. We are going to celebrate together online uh, the service of Holy Communion next Sunday in our home. Please know that I love you. If you need anything, let me know. Inbox me, call me, whatever you need to do, and I will see you next time. Take care, and God bless.